Hi, welcome to this extra section, uh, which is going to cover some of the things that I left out of my DJing for Beginner series. Now, when I put those all online over the last couple days, I kept noticing a few little things here and there that I should have talked about. So I've made a list and I've got about 15 things that I want to talk about quickly today. Now, if you haven't seen the whole series, I'll put a link here to the first part of that series. And uh, it's also useful to know, you don't have to watch those actually in order, one, two, three, four. Um, they're, they're totally independent, so you can watch them in whatever order you want. But it probably makes sense to watch all of those four before you watch this video. Okay. Uh, anyway, so let's get started with a couple of things that I forgot. And I think there's a couple that I may have covered briefly in the other series, but I'll, I'll talk about them anyway. So the first thing is, if you're uncertain about a lot of genres of electronic music, electronica, EDM, whatever you want to call it, dance music, beat-oriented music, um, there's a website, it's called Ishker's Guide to Electronic Music, I-S-H-K-U-R, Ishker's Guide. If you search for it, it's on... Uh, it's either on Digitally Imported or it's on the Techno.org servers right now. Anyway, it's pretty cool. It's a little flash site that uh, you probably can't see on mobile phones, unfortunately. You'll have to watch on a real computer. But basically, they've gone and they've come up with uh, definitions, descriptions, trying to, trying to segment all the different types of electronic music that are out there. Because you'll hear descriptions of tons of different types. Like in the big categories, there's house, trance, techno. But within each of those, and, and more, but within each of those categories, there's tons of subcategories, and they're so confusing, I don't even understand half them. Like, when you're talking about house, um, what's the difference between acid house, dub house, French house, deep house, progressive house, techno house? I mean, there's probably a sci house out there. There's all kinds of stuff. And so if you go to the Ishker's Guide site, you'll see about 40 different categories, and it's very tongue-in-cheek. There's a lot of sarcasm involved, but deep down under, <laughs> underneath, there's a grain of truth to a lot of it. So you can pick one of those subgenres, see a little write-up about it, just a paragraph or two that kind of dis describes the style a little bit, and more importantly, usually has two or three examples of tracks from that style. So I think if you're, if you're trying to understand electronic music a little bit better, you can spend several hours on this site, and it's actually quite entertaining, so I highly, highly recommend it. Okay, if you are trying to learn more about turntables, which I realize is not a large percentage of the people uh, watching this video, but if you're trying to learn more about turntables for the first time, I actually put together a fairly comprehensive written page on my website a few years ago. So I'll put the link up now. You just have to look for djbolivia.ca slash turntables and check that out if you're interested in vinyl. Um, waveform view. Uh, I do remember showing the vinyl record and showing the dark bands, whatnot. If you're looking at CD players, it might be... I, I know some people are going to be looking at low-end CD players because you're on a budget and whatnot. But one thing that I think you'll find is quite important, um, not quite as important as the pitch control. You really need to have pitch control if you're going to be DJing. But a close second, it's really nice to have some sort of waveform display on the CD player so you can see the track laid out and get a good idea when breakdowns and stuff are coming up. Okay, so uh, yeah, think about that when you're shopping for CDs. Uh, secondly, I was talking about requests and how in some places you tend to get requests and some places you don't. Um, you'll find that the crowd, if it's a situation where the people are dancing with each other, um, that's usually where the focus is not so much on the DJ. People are probably going to be likely to go up and ask the DJ for requests for certain music that they like. If you're in a venue where the people, when they're dancing, they're not dancing with each other, they're all facing the front, facing the DJ, that's more of a situation where the DJ is kind of treated as a, as a performer uh, rather than an entertainer, perhaps. And so in that case, you're more likely to have... Um, have the crowd trusting the, the judgment of the DJ, and so they won't make requests, or, or very infrequently make requests, um, and they'll trust the DJ to pick music that's, uh, that's enjoyable and suitable for the, uh, for the style of the performance. Now, if you're about to buy a mixer, you're a beginner DJ, and you're trying to figure out how many channels you need on your mixer, basically when you're mixing, you need at least two, because you want to be able to go back and forth between different songs, but a lot of the DJ mixers will have three, or especially four. Two and, two and four channels is the most common. Three is a little bit less common, but available. 
you don't frequently get more than four channels because usually that's a studio mixer, um, some sort of uh, console for uh, like you know recording studio or for live performance. Anyway, the number of channels that you need. If you're a beginner mixer, you probably are just fine with only a two-channel mixer. Um, eventually, you may start using more than two channels at the same time, but you know it could be a couple years before you get to the point where you want to do that. And I, I'm thinking back to all the mixes that I put on my website over the years, and I bet you of all those, and there's dozens and dozens, there's probably only two or three where I ever actually set it up so I was using three turntables at the same time. Okay. So if you're on a budget, you can go, go with a two-channel. Now, if you are looking for something, if you're investing money in a high-end mixer because you're going to be wanting to play for you know, years and you don't want to have to upgrade once you're better in three or four years, then you will probably be looking at a four-channel mixer. Um, the advantages of a sound card that lets you cue. Okay, this is probably the biggest question I get, period. Uh, people talking about, uh, people who've watched the Ableton videos and stuff like that, people are talking about what do I need in terms of a sound card that lets me do cueing. Okay, so some sound cards will have it set up so that you can route your, um, you can route your audio within your software so that it goes to the master output on the sound card and then goes out to the sound system, but there's a separate way to route audio to the headphone jack that's kind of a weird setup. Most sound cards, if they have a headphone jack on the sound card, they are likely to be set up so that that headphone jack monitors your only stereo output to the mixer. Okay, so if you want to do things in a more professional manner, you want a sound card that does not have just two outputs because usually the two outputs are both mono and so what they are is really one stereo output. So when you see on the box that it has two outputs, be very careful, okay? So really what you need, because you want to be mixing, and if you're mixing, you're going from one channel to another, and remember each channel has to be stereo if you want to have a good sound in your music. So really you need an output with, sorry, a sound card with four outputs, okay? So two of them will be used for one of your music channels, the other two will be used for the other channel. And what you'll do is you'll have those four outputs, two of them routed into one channel on a mixer, two of them routed into another channel on the mixer. And so basically you can have two songs playing at the same time and the mixer will be able to pick between the two different songs. And at that point, you'll be using the cue functions on the mixer to do the cueing. So you'll be plugging your headphones into the mixer and using the cue controls rather than plugging the headphones into the sound card itself. Now, like I say, there are a few sound cards that let you do that plugging into the sound card, but your best bet, if you're looking for a professional sound card, get one with four outputs at least, and do your cueing on a DJ mixer, okay? Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about cueing, I've got a video that I'm actually editing this afternoon, so it's gonna be on YouTube very shortly after this one. Um, and it talks a lot about uh, queuing in depth and uses two separate mixers as examples, the Pioneer DJM 600, generic Pioneer mixer, and the Allen & Heath Zone 62, generic zone mixer, Allen & Heath mixer. Okay, so that'll teach you a little bit more about the queuing. But the sound card, get one with at least four outputs. Uh, IDJ2. Okay, so there's a rig out there called the IDJ2 which basically, it's a little controller and it's got two sides to it for DJing purposes and you can actually plug your iPod into it in the center and you can use the music on your iPad, iPod and you can DJ two sides that way. Um, this is not something I would recommend as a professional thing. Like once you become a professional DJ and you're playing in big clubs and stuff like that, you're never going to use a little rig like this. But Check it out online. I think you'll find out it's kind of, it's pretty neat. And it might be something that's fun to play with when you're learning to DJ, uh, especially if you're not able to buy a lot of expensive equipment like real mixers, real CD players, stuff like that. This will give you a feel for how DJing works. And it can be useful for smaller events where sound quality is not quite as important because sound quality on iPods is not always that great. So this might be useful for house parties, you know, small mobile events where you're just 
taking care of a small crowd. Okay. And on that note uh, of iPods not having the greatest sound quality, of course it depends on what music that you've got on your iPod. But the thing is, iTunes, when they started, the file format that they used for a lot of their music, um, the AAC, it was all 128 kilobits per second. And this is adequate, maybe, for household listening, but it's terrible quality, to be honest. Um, it's, you would never want to be playing 128 kilobit per second MP3s in a club. It just wouldn't sound good on a real good sound system. Now, iTunes has, not too long ago, upgraded, so all the new music that's being fed out is actually 256 kilobits per second, which is pretty decent. I would prefer, if, if I'm playing, I'm going to always play uh, MP3s that are at 320 kilobits per second, nothing lower than that, but at least 256 is, is quite a bit better than 128, certainly, and so you've got some decent bass, you've got some clarity in the treble and stuff like that. So one thing you should know, if you've bought a lot of music from the iTunes store over the years, and a lot of your songs are at 128, I believe it's possible quite easily, if you go into the preferences, you can actually check a box which lets you upgrade your existing library so iTunes will replace the 128 kilobit per second versions of the MP3s in your, in your computer with 256 kilobit per second. And this is free. It's just something, you know, you would think that Apple would do this automatically so everybody's music sounds better. But there are a couple reasons why they didn't. First of all, when they made the change, it would have been an enormous, enormous strain on their servers when, you know, there's millions and millions and hundreds of millions of people around the world having to upgrade their libraries all at once. But also, more importantly, remember that these higher quality files are larger in size. So if your iPod was 95% full and all of a sudden iTunes started trying to double the quality double the size of the files, I should say, um, to, to 256, then there wouldn't be enough room on your iPod to upgrade. So, you know, they didn't want to force that on everyone arbitrarily, but you can check that box, it doesn't cost anything, so, you know, that's something that you may, may want to consider if you're an iTunes user. Um, if you are using a laptop for DJing, or even for audio production, do some research online, make sure you understand how um, how, how the guts of the laptop work, because you're going to want to set it so the operating system is tweaked for performance, um, you know, for the, for the optimal um, use of the program that you're using. You don't want it to be, you know, if you're DJing for a crowd and you don't have a very modern, up-to-date, fast computer that can handle all kinds of stuff happening at once, you don't want your um, your DJ software to be playing a song to the crowd, then all of a sudden in the background, the computer goes and does something like tries to update, you know, go online and, some, and do some sort of update. Because it might cause your audio to drop out temporarily. So, learn how to set your computer up best for performance. If you are making changes to your laptop that could affect the way that it plays to the public, plays out loud, and you're about to go to a gig, make sure you always test it. DJ on it for a couple hours, let it play some music, because if you find that you're getting audio dropouts and stuff like that, you don't want to discover that in the middle of a performance. You don't want to just play it for like three minutes and think, oh yeah, this sounds great. Then you take it to a gig, half an hour in, all of a sudden your audio starts stuttering and you don't know what to do, okay? So test it very carefully at home. Make sure you don't have extra windows open when you're DJing. There's no point having word processors and all sorts of stuff running in the background. And turn your Wi-Fi off. You know, you shouldn't be checking Facebook and email and stuff while you're DJing. Um, not only because of the fact that you should be focusing on your DJing, but, you know, what if notification sounds start popping up in your DJ set? That would be bad. Um, I talked about amplifiers. Now, when you're looking at a home setup, you may hear about a thing called a receiver. And a receiver is just like an amplifier, except that it also has a radio tuner built into it. Now, you know, not a lot of people are using these compared to just pure amplifiers. But if you hear about a receiver, 
It's, it's just like an amp, it just has a tuner in it. Um, what is a monitor? Okay, I talked about booth monitors. Basically a monitor is a different name for a speaker. And the only thing is that monitor, it generally refers to not, a, not necessarily a type of speaker, but just the purpose for which the speaker is being used. So for instance, I can have a booth monitor speaker that normally would be a speaker used for the audience in some situations, but I may, on a particular gig, borrow it and just use it for my own purposes in the DJ booth. That's why it's called a booth monitor, because it allows the performer to monitor the sound instead of having to listen to the same sound through the same speakers that's going out to the, uh, to the audience. So you'll also hear about stage monitors or floor monitors. Quite often stage monitors are speakers that sit on the floor on the stage. And so when you've got a live band or something, you may have three or four stage monitors or floor monitors set up around the band. So there's one in front of each musician uh, so that each musician can actually get a clear sound of, the, um, of what's going on with the rest of the band. And the sound in each monitor can generally be tailored when you're talking about a live sound situation. So for example, let's say that you're playing at a big festival, you know, you've got 100,000 people out there, there's hundreds of speakers blasting sound out there, but the delay from the time that that sound gets back to you on stage, and remember the speakers aren't facing you, it makes it very hard to stay in time with the rest of the band. So these stage monitors are a couple feet in front of each performer in the band, and they've got a good idea about timing for playing with each other. And like say that the um, say that the the rhythm guitarist really wants to hear the drummer quite clearly, but doesn't care so much about what the piano player or the vocalist is doing. You can set each monitor up on your mixing board so it gets a special tailored mix of the sound. So for that guitar player the drums could be turned up a little bit and your piano player and lead vocalist could be turned down a little bit and so for that player you know he's able to he or she is able to get a much better idea of the overall sound but specifically focusing on one or two components of the sound one or two instruments. Okay so that's how, how monitors work. Benefits of LED lighting. Uh, I, I just skimmed to dance floor lighting very quickly and I think I talked about it a little more detail in my mobile DJ video but basically for years uh, all the dance floor lights were halogen halogen lights and so they got very hot the bulbs were expensive they burned out quickly if you left a light on for a couple hours they got incredibly hot and the bulbs would pop all the time and it used to be you know 40 50 bucks easily for for a bulb for a dance light and so if you're buying lights now especially if you're looking to pick up some used secondhand lights, don't go for old style halogen lighting. They may look cheaper, you know, you may think, oh, I can get this light for 50 bucks. But the problem is every time you buy it, burn out a bulb and have to buy another one, you're paying 50 bucks. You know, my dance lights, when I had the old type, I was buying three, four bulbs a year for them sometimes. With the modern LED lighting, they run a lot cooler, they don't burn out, and so you're not going to have to pay that ongoing maintenance cost, okay? I don't think I've ever burned out a bulb in any of my LED lights. Um, recording of a live set. I did talk briefly about the fact that you're going to get uh, a little bit more recognition if you YouTube, if you video a set as a demo for somebody because they're going to realize that you're playing in, lo in real time instead of, um, instead of sequencing it on a computer so they'll realize that these truly are your skills. Another thing that you can do if you start playing at actual live shows is record all your shows because first of all you should always always try to record your set and listen to it afterwards. You learn so much about your own DJing by listening to your set afterwards. It's just incredible. I, I do this with 99 percent of the shows that I play. Always record them. Then, the good thing is, if you've got one that's in good quality and you're happy with the way that you performed, you can put that on the internet and that kind of a demo, if people realize this is the actual live recording of you playing at another event in front of a crowd, that demo carries a lot more weight than something that could have been put together on a computer. Um, when do you play your best tracks? Well, 
in general, save your good tracks for later in the night. Now I know that sometimes, especially when you're starting out as a DJ, early in the night you may be really nervous because you think, oh, there's nobody out dancing, they're not having a good time, maybe I'll play some of my best tracks right now and get them out on the dance floor. But the problem is, if you do that, you play a whole bunch of the hits, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, I've run out of all my best songs, so I'm going to have to play some of my songs that I'm less happy about. And so once you start playing those, maybe the crowd says, oh, this music isn't as good, they kind of lose interest and they stop dancing. Okay? So, early in the night, people don't expect a packed dance floor right at the beginning. And you don't want to play songs twice, so you don't want to use up your good tracks early. So even though you're going to be nervous about the fact that your dance floor is not busy right away, remember about that whole theory about ramping up slowly, you know, music getting faster, getting more energetic, more popular, more well-known songs. Use that opportunity at the beginning of the night to play some songs that maybe, you know, aren't that well-known. And you won't have as many people in the venue usually early in the night anyway, so save your best for last in general. Do you plan out your set in advance? No. That's something I highly, highly recommend you do not do. Now, having said that, everybody kind of looks down on somebody who plans out their set in advance. If you don't, then you're going to be doing a lot more of reacting to the crowd itself, how they're responding to your music. And so if you've got something where you figured out, okay, I'm going to play these 24 tracks in order, and you know, what if the crowd is not, what if you're going through a couple different styles in that set and the crowd's not responding well to one song in a certain style, normally you're going to think, well, I'm not going to play any more songs like that because it's just not working for these particular dancers. Okay, so you'll adjust. But if you've got your set pre-programmed in advance and you think, you know, this is exactly what I'm going to do, you're going to get flustered because all of a sudden you realize your set is not working. Okay, so don't get focused in advance on planning out the exact order. Now, having said that, you have to know your music and you have to know what's gonna work best. And so what I will do is, if I'm going into a night, you know, I may have several hundred tracks on my CDs, on my USB stick or whatever, but I may have about 30 tracks, which are newer tracks, which are the ones that I'm 95% certain almost my entire set is gonna be uh, comprised of tracks from that group of 30. It's the new stuff. It's the good stuff that I want to feature in, in that night's show. So within that group, I will have a very good idea. I'll kind of break them down into two or three or four different groups. So, you know, I might have seven songs that are in my opening music group. I might have 12 songs that are in my peak music group, whatever. So as I'm DJing, I'll be, I'll be queuing stuff listening to it, deciding just on the spur of the moment what I want to play next. And so I'll kind of go through a whole bunch from the opening group first, then from my next group, whatever. Okay, so you should have a pretty good idea of where in the night a track will work well. So it's not the same as exactly programming your set out in advance. It's just understanding your music and knowing when it's appropriate to play certain tracks. Okay? And finally, um, stage presence. I didn't really talk about this. Stage presence is very important as a DJ if you want to have the crowd engage with you and remember you better. So there's really two parts to stage presence. And this is one of my weaknesses, to be honest, because one of those two parts I'm not great at. Now the first part is that you've got to look like you're having fun, you're bouncing around, you're energetic, stuff like that as you're playing. That's something that's easy for me. You know, I always do it naturally. And the second part is trying to communicate with your audience. So, you know, always be smiling, always keep your head up, not looking down at your music, not looking down at your mixer, and looking around and making eye contact with different people in the crowd. Now, I find that to be harder, and a lot of DJs find that to be harder, because I focus more on, when I'm DJing, I focus more on technical stuff and mixing, just because of the style of music I play. I don't uh, focus as much on just playing huge pop mainstream hits. So, you know, I think for a DJ that plays more mainstream stuff, it's a little bit easier to just start the song and focus on the crowd. And for me, I'm paying more attention to the music. 
And that's unfortunate. You know what? I have to force myself all the time to keep looking my head up, lifting my head up, and looking around at people and smiling and stuff like that. So it's very natural for me to be energetic and bouncy, dancing around, but that crowd, contact with the crowd, um, you know, you're gonna have to work at that a little bit harder. And that's the case for a lot of people, not just, not just for me, okay? So stage presence, very important. Remember, you're an entertainer and a performer. You're not just some, uh, some hidden, hidden presence in the background that nobody's paying attention to, okay? Uh, I believe that's everything, and so thanks again for watching, and sorry I didn't get these into the uh, regular set of uh, videos in a more logical order, okay? Cheers!